Uh, my name is Tetsuo Yasaka. I'm from Kyushu University, Japan. Um, one and a half decades ago, back in Japan, which has many features uh, common with Britain, not only in topology, I started to organize universities to initiate hands-on education, hands-on space education, in, to, to construct small satellites. And since then, we have more than 30 universities joining our group, and nine satellites, those uh, uh, student-built satellites were launched. And many of them are operating in orbit right now. And this is, um, this is the, really the uh, young, young people's imagination coming into reality. And uh, this is a trend, not only in J Japan or in Britain, it is all over in the world, in Europe, Americas, in Asia, and probably in Africa and Oceania as well. And all, all of those people who are engaged in this field have one unique target or dream to get closer to what Surrey University has achieved. Starting from the development of small satellite by student involvement, coming into a venture business, and now positioned as the leading space industry in the world. Now, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce to you tonight uh, Professor Sir Martin Sweeting, who is the founder of SSTL and uh, the uh, uh, leading person in this emerging industry and also the uh, chairman of the organizing committee of this IAC 2008, Martin. Well, thank you, Professor Yasaka, for that very um, nice introduction, and I'm sure not totally deserved. But uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending this evening and coming away from the temptations of the exhibition and the whiskey in order to hear my words uh, on small satellites. And I'm going to describe to you as a, essentially a case study the experience that we have had over the last couple of decades at the University of Surrey and its role in taking research from a university environment into industry and into a commercial activity. But maybe we should go back a little bit further um, from, uh, from the last two decades and have a look at how things have evolved. You know, generally, I think we were asked, believe that the most successful species on the planet are humans, and I suppose that's natural. But I'm not sure that that's so convincing, because if you actually stop and think about it, insects have been around for an awful lot longer, there's many more of them, and they have managed to survive many climate changes and other uh, disasters. And so maybe there is something that we can, uh, can learn from this evolutionary uh, tale. And of course, evolution started out with microbes in the oceans, and then amphibians, and then moving on to uh, uh, land-based creatures. And they grew and grew, got bigger and bigger, until we had, during the Jurassic period, very large, powerful, but hungry uh, animals. Now, interestingly, the same has happened with satellites. The very early satellites were, were tiny, uh, but they grew and grew until they became extremely large. But rather like the dinosaurs, the, the climate has changed over the last 20 years. And at the end of the Cold War, budgets have been cut, new technologies have emerged driven by the commercial pressures rather than military pressures. And uh, what this has done is to create a new species of warm-blooded, and what I'd like to hope a fleet of foot, and thinking satellites. And so, like the age of the mammals past the age of the dinosaurs, the microsatellite uh, has been born. So with this model, I would like this afternoon to ask a number of questions and, and discuss how this has happened. 
first of all, we should perhaps look at what are small satellites, how universities have moved from academia into enterprise, and then actually what is it that small satellites can really do, particularly in a business and commercial environment, and perhaps then conclude uh, with a glimpse into the uh, future. Well, early small satellites, as I indicated, or rather early satellites, as I indicated, were indeed small. The very first satellites actually were, were quite tiny. Um, they were really constrained by the availability and the limited launcher capabilities of the time. But as the launcher capacity and capability grew, so the satellites got fatter. And uh, there was the temptation to put more payloads on a single satellite, and hence the satellites got bigger, more complex. Uh, they got higher cost, of course. Projects took longer and longer to go from concept into orbit, and the missions required very complex ground support, both before launch and, of course, once they were in orbit. Now, of course, we have to recognize that this type of, this class of large satellite, and there's an example here, I think, of an eight-ton, if I'm correct, Envisat. Um, these satellites are somewhat of a luxury goods. They are not a mass-produced item. And uh, when you look at the access to space through the launchers, this is also an expensive proposition. So if you are going to launch, a, spend a lot on a, a, on a launcher, it makes sense to make sure your satellite carries as much as you can fit on it and that you make it as reliable as possible. And this tends, unfortunately, to create a vicious circle whereby the satellites get more complex, they take longer, and they cost more. And space, of course, is a remote place, and it's very unforgiving. If you make any errors, it's very difficult and indeed very expensive to go back up, press the reset button, and fix it. And so, all in all, space is not an easy business to be in. And indeed, if you're advising young uh, graduates who are interested in space, I say, if you want to make money, don't choose space. Do something else, like making TVs or sandwiches, which everybody wants. Um, and uh, space is really for, for those that have imagination and determination and uh, resilience. Anyway, what are small satellites? Well, it's not one uh, dimension. It's not just mass. It's not just time or cost. It's actually a function of all of these. It's the combination of the size of the satellite, the time it takes to go from concept to orbit, the cost, and then finally and importantly, the utility. And this is something which is very prevalent when we're looking at the uh, applications and usefulness of very tiny satellites. When we can reduce the mass and time considerably and the cost, but we have to examine the utility. So we have to balance all these factors in the equation. So just to be clear, this is not what we're talking about. You can see, uh, again, a, a five, six ton uh, spacecraft with a gentleman at the bottom there, a big, complex spacecraft, remarkable in its performance and weighing well over, in this case, I think it was six or seven tons, cost many hundreds of millions of dollars. And when you look at the total cycle from first thoughts through to operations, it was over a decade. And during that decade, technology has moved on. So instead, we're looking at the other end of the scale, at the very tiny satellites. And in comparison, you can see one here. And when we talk about small satellites, we're generally considering those in a family below 1,000 kilos, and typically, usually a couple of hundred kilos and down, to nano satellites in the region of 1 to 10 kilos, and more recently, pico satellites, maybe the order of 100 grams or more, but costing correspondingly less, and also going rapidly uh, through their design and development cycle to launch. So that in microsatellites, typically, we might see uh, development and construction times of one to one and a half years, and for nanosatellites, sometimes even less than that. And that's not the end of the story either, because there are, again, three components to small satellite capabilities. Of course, and the main focus of the talk here has been the actual satellites themselves. But as I've indicated, it's very important to be able to get readily available and low-cost launches, because there's no point in having a low-cost satellite if you can't put it into orbit. And then what is often forgotten is what happens once it's in orbit. The operation of the spacecraft, sometimes over five, six, seven years, particularly in a commercial environment, uh, can, uh, if you adopt a, a hands-on approach, can cost as much as the spacecraft and the launch itself. And so um, we need low-cost 
autonomous orbital operations. And it's these three ingredients, alongside the other factors I mentioned earlier, that really start to characterize what we mean by small satellites. So how are they different to these large satellites I've been discussing, the so-called dinosaurs? Well, what we've done is to leverage the enormous investment that's been uh, placed into the development primarily of modern consumer and industrial products. So the typical the things that you use in terms of the mobile phone, digital cameras, you know, Xboxes, and the like, uh, using microelectronics and MEMS devices, these have been enormous investments to create very sophisticated electronics. And now we try to take advantage of this and adapt these devices for use in a space environment. And by doing that, we can produce rapid response and very highly capable spacecraft which are physically small but yet provide high capability and at low cost by using these advanced terrestrial technologies adapted appropriately for use in a space environment. And because the development cycle of the satellites is kept short, we can also use the freshest terrestrial technology. So quite often the technology we see in the small satellites can be a few years old rather than possibly one or two decades old. And this model of taking commercial off-the-shelf components, using them as appropriate in orbit, is severely changing the economics of the space and space business. So what are the key features of small satellites? Well, first of all, empty pockets. Don't have too much money. Make sure you design to cost and achieve what you can within the small budget. Necessity is the mother of invention. Short schedules. The longer you spend building your satellite, the more you spend on people building it, and so consequently the costs rise. As I've mentioned, the use of commercial off-the-shelf technologies means that you have the highest capabilities available to you, generally the lowest power and the lowest cost and lowest volume. But it's not just the technical solutions. It's also risk management and management of teams. To manage risk, not eliminate it. To have sensible documentation approaches. Of course, you must document what you do, but the documentation is there to help, not provide just an insurance policy. And then to take an, what I would perhaps summarize as a more IT management style compared to traditional aerospace management techniques so that you have very strictly devolved responsibilities down to teams so that decisions are made rapidly and at the right levels. And of course, none of this is magic. It's just adopting what is often used in terrestrial environments to space projects. And then finally, innovative and imaginative thinking, which of course provides us with some of the ideas to go that step further than uh, the, what is normally predicted. So the second part of the ingredient is, uh, is low-cost launches. How do we get these small satellites into orbit? And there have been many ways of doing this. In the early days, they were through piggyback launches, sitting either on rings around a major satellite, or as you see uh, down here, uh, microsatellites sitting, in fact, strapped on to, bolted onto a large Russian spacecraft, which was very resilient, and uh, once in orbit, jumped off the mothership. Um, Secondary launches where we get uh, combinations of uh, satellite with, uh, of similar sizes, clusters, and then finally primary launches. And in some, indeed there have been examples of primary launches from submarines of small satellites, um, piggyback cluster launches on the Ariane uh, ASAP, or auxiliary structure for payloads, and indeed the uh, cluster launches on the Cosmos. And one of the, the most successful uh, launches for small satellites and cost-effective launches has been the Dnieper, which carries something in excess of 1,000 kilos into low Earth orbit and has been the workhorse over the last uh, six or seven years of many small satellite missions, including uh, some cases carrying a large cluster of uh, nanosatellites or multiple uh, microsatellites into orbit. And this is a very good use a uh, good example of the use of what was originally missile technology, now used for uh, more commercial and peaceful uses. And then the third ingredient is orbital operations, making sure that despite having the, the satellite, in mostly in low Earth orbit, spends the majority of its time out of the range of the ground station, 
that when it is in sight of a ground station, the operations of the ground station and the spacecraft are automated to the extent possible. Here is a picture of our ground station a few years ago. We have just one operator at that time, I think, looking after 14 spacecraft, most of which were operated by the uh, computer, rather, they were all operated by uh, computers on the ground, talking to the spacecraft and alerting the operators should, on very rare occasions, something go wrong. So here we have a mechanism for reducing the lifetime running costs of the satellites through onboard and ground-based autonomy and also using a network of automated ground stations around the world interconnected by the internet. And most recently, we have seen some interesting activities in the university sector with the Ginzo project linking um, university groups around the world in their ground stations. So let's uh, for a moment have a look back at the, the history that I indicated at the beginning at Surrey. Starting back in 1975, actually the first interest in space came out of the amateur radio community, tracking some of the very early amateur radio satellites like Oscar 6, and then tracking some of the weather satellites uh, from both the US and then Soviet Union, which now weather satellite images we take for granted, but in those days it was quite exotic. And then finally deciding that as the very first microcomputers were emerging to see whether we could use this new technology to build a small satellite that was not only physically small, but had the last ingredient in the equation, that it had some good utility. And you can see the, the original, it wasn't exactly the Apollo uh, group here, but it was the trendy 1970s uh, team of four that started the first USAT spacecraft at the University of uh, Surrey. And as you can see, apart from the, my clothes have got smarter, I also had more hair in those days. And uh, 20 years of satellite takes its, uh, clearly takes its toll. But this first spacecraft was designed and built and launched as a secondary payload, courtesy of NASA, underneath another university project. Here is the microsatellite as a secondary payload on board a university um, um, satellite from the University of Colorado and NASA launched on a, on a Delta in 1981, which continued to operate for uh, eight years. And in the course of its operation, one of its uh, payloads uh, carried a digital uh, digitalker, a voice synthesizer, and some 1,400 schools were involved in this and its subsequent spacecraft in learning firsthand what space meant. So if we now fast forward the video to 2000 and, uh, sorry, 2000, it should be 2008, uh, to 2008, we now see that uh, space at Surrey has gone from those four people in the early days now to two groups, an academic group, which is approximately 60, 10 faculty and 50 researchers studying a wide range of technical topics on all aspects of uh, um, aer uh, astronautics and uh, control, hardware and software in many uh, different applications for Earth orbit and interplanetary um, environments. And as a result of the early work, in 1985, the university spun out a company called Surrey Satellite Technology Limited, or now known as SSTL, um, in order to transfer the ideas that were developing the research labs into a commercial environment. And this was actually stimulated by the very fact that there was no uh, national space program. It had just actually been essentially cancelled at that point, and all the UK funding was predominantly then channeled through the European Space Agency. Of course, very pleased that it did that, but what it did mean was there was very little in the way of national funding for space initiatives. And so the only way that we could continue our research was to go out and persuade uh, our customers that it had commercial value. And looking back, I think this was one of the really critical uh, uh, steps. And now SSTL has grown to 300 people um, in uh, uh, five uh, locations, including a new uh, company formed in the US, and will shortly change its ownership because it's outgrown the university and uh, its shareholding will be uh, taken by EADS Astrium within the next few months. Over the last 27 years, we have built and launched 32 spacecraft. And of course, one of the questions that small satellites, if they are cheaper, are they less reliable? It's interesting to note that actually over these 32 satellites, we have a 94% mission success rate. 
And so it indicates that the use of commercial off-the-shelf technologies done appropriately actually can provide very high uh, reliability. And our latest launch was only a few weeks ago, again on the Dnepro launcher I showed you earlier, where five satellites, microsatellites, 135 kilos each, were launched into low Earth orbit for the first commercial Earth observation constellation. But the question is, you know, if these satellites are small, so small, what, they cannot do anything useful. That is the critics. And what I'd like very quickly to show you now is that they have uh, applications in communications, technology verification, Earth observation, science, navigation in both civil and military applications. And indeed, they can do things in some cases which large satellites cannot do. In the 90s, the first application for these small satellites was in email services, physically carrying email around the world and dropping it off to ground terminals before the uh, internet was so pervasive. And it also provided the early research for some of the communication surveillance satellites like the French ESIAN system. Most importantly as well, it helps understand space weather and its effects on the commercial off-the-shelf components. Critical if we're going to be able to use these devices reliably in space. So studying the space radiation environment and its impact on the modern devices is critical. The platforms have been used for technology verification, trying out new ideas such as different types of batteries and ultra-quiet platforms which can then be used on big satellites. So before these new technologies are uh, put on very expensive satellites, they can be verified using quick response, low cost uh, platforms. Research, such as a mission launched I think now a year and a half ago uh, for Los Alamos, studying uh, lightning in the upper atmosphere. The microsatellites have taken the internet into orbit. The first uh, satellite with an internet address was USAT-12 in 1998, followed by experiments with the UK DMC satellite using a Cisco router to demonstrate the use of secure internet protocols for commanding and retrieving, tasking the satellite with image data and then getting it back to remote portable locations. And these satellites have been the focus as well of uh, international cooperation, widening the access to space and encouraging new nations to take their first steps in space in an affordable and sensible manner with capacity building as engineers are trained as a nucleus in many cases of their space agencies and generating their own national capabilities. And a very good example of the power of small satellites is not by using them singly but by using them, in this case as an international collaboration, launching, in this case, five satellites into uh, low Earth orbit, synchronizing them so that they orbit the Earth, and then with images on board, they can image wide swaths of the, of the Earth and together image anywhere on the Earth's surface within 24 hours. And this capability came into its own during the Indian Ocean tsunami disaster, which, which was a disaster of enormous proportions geographically, and only a constellation uh, providing this type of coverage could rapidly assess the damage and then guide both the high resolution uh, satellites which were then taking uh, image data uh, and compare on the left you see before and on the right after so that maps could be derived and distributed rapidly to the aid agencies um, to uh, direct their research. Now, in recent years, these satellites have had increasing resolution. Whilst being small, about half the size of this podium, their, in, their uh, spatial resolution on the ground has been increasing rapidly. And the Disaster Monitoring Constellation's main imager, which has a wide area coverage at 32 meters, on the latest version of this satellite, has a four meter telescope, which allows both large scale uh, uh, multispectral imaging and panchromatic imaging, in this case um, covering the whole of uh, uh, China within a six month period. An example of the four meter panchromatic data looking at aircraft on an airfield, the pan sharpened uh, multispectral data for looking at urban development in China, and then as an example from the UK uh, TopSat spacecraft. Um, 2.5 meter imaging during the Farnborough Air Show where those of you with good eyesight can differentiate the different sizes of aircraft uh, being ready for the, uh, for the air show. Now small satellites have got bigger 
and the largest of these was the GOVA spacecraft, 600 kilos, which was constructed in just 30 months for 30 million euros and launched on time and provided the first uh, signals for Europe's Galileo system in orbit um, as the forerunner for the full uh, constellation. And if we look at the other end of the scale, from the larger small satellites of 600 kilos, two orders of magnitude down from 60 to 6 kilos, a nanosatellite. This is a spacecraft the size of a beach ball. And you can see it in the uh, picture here in its underclothes. It doesn't have its solar rays on. Here is a finger, so you can get the size of it. Here is the propulsion system as a, against the pencil. And this satellite had onboard GPS navigation, S-band downlinks, three-axis control, and onboard uh, imaging. And this spacecraft was used to image uh, mothership as it left a uh, Russian satellite in orbit. And then using its onboard propulsion and GPS navigation systems to chase after a target satellite and then uh, attempt a, a rendezvous using uh, its onboard propulsion. So this satellite was launched in 2000. It was completed with nine, within nine months from blank sheet of paper to launch and cost about a million euros. So it's still more money than I get paid in a, in a year, but for small satellites, it's quite, uh, quite cheap. And as Professor Isaka has mentioned, this has now spawned an interest in these small satellites worldwide. And as my last count, they're in excess of 100 universities worldwide which have nanosatellite projects. But perhaps finally, we can look beyond the Earth. Small satellites, and can they go beyond Earth orbit? Well, we're very interested at Surrey in taking the next step, and that is to explore the use of the small satellite techniques that we've developed to lower the cost and increase the tempo of uh, solar system exploration, and to create a network of satellites around the moon in the first instance to provide communications and positioning services in order to support the international lander program over the next decade, and to use this as the basis of a commercial service to provide an internet around the moon and to provide navigation or well, more positioning services on the moon. When you're on the lunar surface, one crater looks much like the other. There's not much to guide you. And so these two missions are being proposed in the UK to look at uh, preparing the infrastructure for sustained human habitation on the Mars, on the moon. The first of these will be a polar orbiter called Moonlight, carrying the communications and positioning uh, payloads, but also some multiple penetrators, which will uh, uh, leave the spacecraft, the mothership, as you will see here. They will be deployed in orbit. They will be then decelerated using an onboard uh, rocket motor. Uh, that will kill the orbital velocity so that the penetrators, which in the tip of the penetrators is essentially a hardened nanosatellite, which is going to do some um, uh, surface science once it penetrates. So once the uh, velocity of the penetrator has been killed, it then falls to the surface of the moon and will impact the lunar surface at about 300 meters per second. It has to be reoriented to within about eight degrees of the lunar normal, and then this is the last we see. The penetrator will go something between one to three meters below the surface, trail out an antenna, and then measure some of the uh, lunar science. I guess you've all forgotten about the insects. Well, PICO and FEMTO satellites. We're working on satellites on a chip. These satellites can then be deployed in swarms or clusters. And so you have a complete satellite on a chip using some of the latest micro miniaturization systems. And then we can explore using this swarm of satellites as a virtual satellite formed by a network of either co-orbiting satellites flying in formation or loosely and then using the distributed systems, rather like a network of PCs, to combine the power of these individual components by regenerating phase fronts or recalibrating and then creating sparse aperture arrays or coherent communications. And rather like the insects that I showed you, an ant. If an ant approaches, tries to eat your house, a swarm of ants, you can tread on one or two or three and there's still hundreds of that will take their place. And here we have swarms of these tiny satellites. If one or two fail, we can rely on the rest. So using the latest MEMS technologies and microelectronics, 
we are seeing satellites truly becoming very tiny. So in conclusion, what I've tried to show you is the COTS technologies are rapidly increasing the capability and tempo of uh, small satellites in space. This is reducing the cost of entry into space and the time to get into orbit. And it's in constellations and swarms where small satellites really have the advantage. They can do things that big satellites cannot do. Not because big satellites don't have the technology, but it's just too expensive to put so many of them in one place at a time. And whereas small satellites 20 years ago were considered by my supervisor at the time as a mild form of lunacy and that I should go and get a proper job, um, now they have moved from being very experimental and interesting through to research applications of the last decade and in this decade now carrying out real applications such as RapidEye as the first commercial uh, constellation of small microsatellites which is going to be funded and operated fully commercially. So the operational capabilities are growing and this is now creating new space activities, opportunities and businesses which will become financially viable as well as technically possible. And in fact, as we see, more small satellites are becoming a mainstream component of the space industry. Still a small strand, but like the PC 20 years ago, I'm sure it has a bright future. And it is enabling not just responsive space in the civil field and the commercial field, but it's also changing military thinking. And looking forward, the small satellite business is expected to grow to something like one billion and within five years. So, like the personal computer that transformed computing 20 years ago, space is becoming accessible to a far wider community than was dreamt of when uh, I was a PhD student. And like the PC, the advantage of small satellites is by networking them in numbers. It is truly a disruptive technology that is changing the economics of space. With that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.